Hello everyone and everywhere. Uh, welcome back to the new AV lecture series on water governance theoretical perspectives. It's a great honor and pleasure uh, to have Eric Svinkato here today with us. Um, Eric uh, is professor of human geography at the University of Manch Manchester. Uh, his work has uh, profoundly impacted the, the field of water politics and critical urban geographies. Following the steps of David Harvey, his PhD advisor, Eric is today one of the most well-known and influential heterodox Marxist geographers. Eric, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, the floor is yours for 30 minutes, and then uh, we will give you five minutes uh, to answer some of the selected questions that we will collect in the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Paul. Um... It's a pity, of course, that we cannot do this uh, live face to face uh, and that we have to do it um, in this distance sort of way. Welcome everyone, wherever you roam. This is the beginning of a Bob Dylan song, I think, uh, which I would have sung to you if I were a good singer, but I'm not. Um, for those who have looked at the syllabus of this e-lecture series, it is quite impressive. Uh, it's a quite impressive lineup, and I was wondering what I could contribute to this already quite um, uh, 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 quite fantastic uh, set of speakers. Um, I sent a few papers um, for you to read or to consider. What I'm going to do, though, is not speak about those papers that I circulated, but I'm going to talk around the general uh, uh, the general debate around the question of the political ecology in the context of considering the serious problem of water politics, water governance, um, and water struggles, water conflicts. The title of my talk, and I hope it will become clearer uh, later on, is A Critique of the Political Economy and Political Ecology of the Hydro-Social Cycle. So for me, it's, I, 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 I'm always slightly intrigued and amused when I am asked to speak at uh, conferences or policy uh, uh, meetings, et cetera, that are specifically focused on water. Because many people think that I am a water specialist and that I'm quite obsessed in many ways with water as a object of both uh, academic research and political struggle. In fact, I am not. I am really not particularly interested in water. For me, water is nothing more than a symptom. So um, um, the way I approach the water the problem is not as a object or the thing in itself, but rather as a symptom of something else. Whereby the question always comes up, what is water there for? So for me, as I just said, it's a symptom of wider political ecological relations of social and political power and of mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion. Water as such, H2O so to speak, is for me a fetish. Um, a focus on the object of water for me actually displaces attention away from what is really key, which are the relations between people who are need, oops. Uh, uh, it takes attention away from the relations between people mediated through things to the relations between people and things. So I think in much of water research and water debate, water is fetishized, both in a Marxist sense of the word, but also in a psychoanalytic sense of the word. And it's precisely this fetishization, I would argue, that often leads to water being considered as a question of techno-managerial organization and a question of governance. And I would argue that this sort of perspective really leads to the depoliticization of the socio-ecological question. So in that sense, the first statement I want to make is that water does not exist. The only thing that exists are particular, material, discursive, political, cultural, and economic, socio-ecological relations. 
through which water flows. So I, would, I, I want to put the emphasis on the relationships and not on the thing itself. Just to suggest that water is a complex, and many of you, most of you undoubtedly know that, is a chaotic concept to speak, to say the least. Is water chemically uh, represented by H2O or by H9O4 plus? Is it hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Is it public or private? Is it scarce or abundant? Is it benign and innocent or threatening and dangerous? Is it clean or dirty? Is it mine? Is it yours? Is it ours? Is it about eros or thanatos? Is it healthy or unhealthy? Does it stand for a kind of gendered female purity? Or is it really the object of boys' toys, like in big dams and other big infrastructures? So this all suggests that H2O is a complex thing that in itself has a whole variety of practices, meaning, meanings and symbolic inscriptions associated with it. And it's precisely those meanings, inscriptions, etc., that I think we should be focusing on. Very often, I'm being told that the political ecology, the political ecology of water, say, or of wind, or of an iPhone, that that is in itself a critical approach, a critical perspective, that your political ecology is inherently your political. I'm going to take issue with that. I disagree. Of course, we had already historically, we had for a long time uh, a concern with the political economy of nature, um, such as explored by people like Malthus, the physiocrats, the Cardo, Adam Smith, Keynes, and others. For those who are focusing on the political economy of nature, they consider the non-human environment as an integral and vital, but external condition of and for economic growth and social change. It considers, for example, the political economy of dams, of large water urban systems, irrigation systems, desalination projects, etc., And it on the whole focuses on institutions, on governance arrangements, on capital movement and investment, on the flow of commodities, etc. Then, of course, there is a more explicitly political ecology of nature. And I associate that with people like Hardin or Ostrom or Bruno Latour and many, many others. For the political ecologists, in contrast to political economists, the non human is integral to and an internal condition of and for economic growth and processes of socio-ecological transformation. We can do, for example, and that has been done, uh, the political ecology of, for example, hydro social configuration in their embedding in particular institutional configuration of configurations of uneven socio-ecological development with a focus on the social and political significance of non-human matter. There's nothing particularly critical, let alone radical, about such a perspective. So I want to make a plea for the critique of political ecology. Uh, because there is, of course, an actually existing political ecology of capitalism. That is precisely the process through which capitalist socio-ecological relations are reproduced, produced, and deepened. So there is a political ecology of any kind of social configuration. A critique of this Capitalist your political ecology unearths, that's what it tries to do, unearths the power relations, the inconsistencies, the systematic in inequalities, and the conflicts through which the political ecology of capitalism, of capitalism is sustained, whereby the point is not just, just to understand the world as political ecology tries to do, but to change it. And that is, I think, is the task of the critique of political ecology. It's one that relates the material to the imaginary and that in doing so contributes to imagining and practicing different egalitarian and durable socio-ecological futures. So this notion of a critique of political ecology is of course borrowed from Marx. For those who've ever looked at the cover of Marx's Magnus Opus, Capital, they will know 
that the subtitle of Capital is a critique of political economy. That is the political economy of people like uh, Ricardo and Smith and Malthus. So what we need today, I would argue, is again, capital, a critique of political ecology. Take, for example, one of the great uh, political ecologists, uh, uh, Hardin, and his notion of the tragedy of the commons. And I'm sure most of you are fully aware of uh, Hardin's argument that in a context where uh, the, the, the resources are common, like the pasture for cattle, but where the cattle is held in private, that that of necessity leads to a tragedy of the commons, to a destruction of the common environmental conditions around which the production and reproduction of privately owned cattle unfolds. I think Harlan is absolutely right. I can't find a flaw in his argument. So what would the critique of political ecology of Hardin start off with? And for me, a critique of Hardin resides in examining his clearly asymmetrical assumptions upon which his impeccable reasoning is based. He assumes as is indeed the case in much of the capitalist or liberal form of organizing the environment that the commons of nature is indeed held in common, but that the means of production, in this case, the cows are privately held. I would like to challenge you and invite you to repeat Hardin's logic, but assume a symmetrical starting base that both the commons of the land is held in common as well as the commons of the means of production. The dynamic of the tragedy of the commons that Hardin unfolds will disappear as snow for the sun. So capital a critique is a critique of the socio-ecological relations that structure the expanded circulation of capital. I think most of you are familiar with the circulation of capital and accumulation dynamics, which is basically nothing more than the transformation of money into nature that is then combined in a production process to produce new forms of nature that is turned into money and that is repeated in, in, a, in a continuously expanding, uh, expanding cycle of money or capital accumulation. So the flow of money moves in the direction of my main arrow. And of course, the flow of natures flows in the opposite direction. I would argue that the critique of political ecology is precisely about reconstructing and reconstituting this dual but reverse flows of value and money in one direction and the flows of human and non-human matter in the other direction. This circulation of capital, and it's not that difficult to see how the circulation of water, the hydrosocial circulation of water is deeply implicated uh, in the circulation of capital is always, that relationship is always structured by social relations around ownership, the right of transformation, and the conditions of distribution of human and non-human matter. It is precisely that process that produces particular, historically, geographically distinct, but radically uneven socio-ecological power relationship. And their associated uneven patterning of control and access to socially transformed nature. And because of that deeply ingrained constitutive inequality, the circulation of capital and its reverse circulation of socio-ecological matter is always accompanied by a set of conflicts, a set of tensions. And these conflicts and these tensions are integral to the production and to the production of the socio-ecological matrix. So what I'm calling for here is basically a relational perspective on the hydro-social cycle. 
a relational perspective that considers relations to be internal to the very process that one uh, considers. There are, of course, many forms of relationality, many ways of mobilizing re relationality. In mainstream political ecology, re relationality is understood as establishing connections between a priori fixed categories, objects, or conditions, like nature, society, water, culture, economy. So a priori constitute categories and some relationship is established between these. Or another way of doing this is to establish connections between constructed, but discrete objects, categories of conditions. For example, connection between modernity and water infrastructure, uh, um, which are also, it's also a form of thinking of relations between externally constituted conditions, categories, or, 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 or objects. <coughs> a critique of political ecology, in contrast, is predicated on the mobilization of a theory of internal relations. That is that relations are internal to the very object, conditions, or processes one wants to consider. That basically, basically means that one has to understand things, whether it's water, a dam, an irrigation system, a conflict over water, like if things, they do not exist outside of the relationship to which they become constituted. So that's what I meant when I said water does not exist. Water does not exist outside of the relationship to which it becomes constituted. These internally constituted relations are often conflicting full of tensions, contested, contentious. So things cannot be understood, therefore, outside the relationally constituted the process through which they become into being and through which they change. And this is, of course, a view very much, very much borrowed from Marxist historical geographical materialism which also says that social relations become constituted in and through the relations with nature. All social relations, in other words, are fundamentally socio-ecological relations. Any kind of form of social organization is predicated upon a particular set of socio-ecological or socio-physical relations. Under capitalism, this social relation is constituted in and through, as I said earlier, through an expanding flow of money, what they would hardly call the circulation of capital. And it's so difficult to see how all manner of non-human matter or enrolled and transformed within this continuous, relentless, mad dance of the circulation of capital. So we therefore have to understand, I would argue, accumulation and you can easily see that in the water sector too, accumulation is the process of socio-physical appropriation, transformation, and distribution of what I call social natures that operates through the social relations of capitalist production and reproduction, and is animated, the engine of that's animated by the mobilization of money and its transformation into capital. So basically, in the work that I've been trying to do over the past uh, 20 years or so with respect to the circulation and metabolism of non-human matter, in particular H2O, I was particularly interested in teasing out how the flows of money articulated in complex, heterogeneous and conflicting way with the flow of transformed nature, and in my case, H2O with radical transformations of H2O as it moved through the hydrosocial, the urban hydrosocial landscape. So for me, I considered the flows of water as a symptomatic entry point, 
a holistic device, not as an object in itself, but as a means into excavating the flows of power that structured highly uneven class, ethnic, or race-based socio-ecological relations. So the key mantra of political, the critique of political ecology is follow the flow, not of the thing, but the thing as the symptom of the social relations that animate, that are the drivers, the engines of the, of, of the flow of matter, in this case, H2O. So waters, waters, and I now use it in plural because there's no such thing as a singular, a singular water. Uh, it's not just a thing, it's a process. Water does not exist, as I said, outside the socio-physical relations through which it is constituted. And flows of power do signal the contradictory that is full of tensions, socio-physical relations through which water flows. So a critique of political ecology or the a critique of the political ecology of water is therefore primarily concerned with excavating the social natural relations of power through which water circulates. And that was the, 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 the focus of my book on uh, hydro modernities in 20th century Spain, which I gave the title Liquid Power. It's about the historical geographical reconstruction of the past, the present, and potential futures. It's doing the archaeology of hydro social relations as they are expressed by and contained through, structured by the hydro social cycle. And that, of course, includes stitching together, so to speak, uh, 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 in a quilting relationship, stitching together materially the processes, the material acting of water in its various ways, the social relations of ownership, of, trans of transformation, of distribution, and access around that material acting, the institutional embedding of it, the range of discourses, or rather fantasies, or perhaps ideologies uh, 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 that circulate around the particular social mechanisms through which water becomes mobilized and transformed. It includes considering the cultural practices, uh, ideological formations that legitimize or contest particular forms of hydrosocial organizations. And of course, most importantly, it includes considering hydropolitical fantasies. What in what ways can we imagine different ways of socially organizing the hydrosocial, um, the hydrosocial cycle? So the critique of political ecology is about the deconstruction of the heterogeneous relations and the networks of power that support any hydrosocial edifice, an irrigation system, a dam, um, uh, an urban water supply system, um, whatever. It's dynamics of change and it's internally and externally constituted conflicts with an eye towards, and that is crucial, with an eye towards politicizing the matter of natures. So, to begin to uh, summarize, I'm going to conclude with, um, and, 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 and as an unreconstructed Marxist, we always come up with manifestos. So I here have to conclude the political ecological manifesto uh, for hydrosocial research, predicated around the critique of political ecology. So first of all, a critique of political ecology is predicated upon uh, uh, understanding, grappling with the processes of socio-environmental metabolic circulation and how they transform socio-physical environments and produce in the process socio-physical or socio-ecological milieus with new and distinct qualities. 
So here I basically summarize the notion of the production of nature, the social production of nature in a material as well as in a discursive and imaginative sense. Second, there is therefore nothing a priori unnatural about the produced environments like damped rivers, desalination stations, sewage treatment plants, or irrigated fields. Produced environments, historically, the produced environments are specific historical and geographical results of socio environmental metabolic processes. All these socio-spatial processes are invariably also predicated upon the circulation and the metabolism of physical, chemical, and or biological components. So the social and the physical have to be continuously and in a, a, a fused together in a non-binary manner. Now these metabolisms, it's a, it's a term that I, that I borrowed, of course, from, from Marx. These metabolisms, these socio-ecological metabolisms, they produce a series of both enabling for some and disabling for others' socio-environmental conditions. Indeed, these produce milieus or invariably uneven and unequally structured and often embody contradictory tendencies. Consequently, and fifth, the processes of metabolic change are therefore never socially or ecologically neutral. Social power geometries that are articulated through these material flows, in this case of water, representational practices and contested imaginaries shape the particular social, political, and biophysical configurations, and thus the environment in which we live. It is these six conditions that are the core of a critique of political ecology that demonstrate how questions of socio-environmental reproduction become fundamentally political ones. So political ecology or the critique of political ecology attempts to tease out who gains from, who pays for, who benefits from, and who suffers and in what ways from particular processes of metabolic circulatory change. The political program then of critical political ecology of the critique of political ecology, and that is of course the key objective, the objective that is often willfully ignored or sidelined, but which we all nonetheless know is the crucial variable. The political program then of a critique of political ecology is to enhance the democratic, that means egalitarian, politically speaking, content of socio-environmental construction by means of identifying the strategies through which a more equitable distribution of social power and a more inclusive mode of producing natures can be achieved. So a critique of political ecology has a focus on what I would call equitable durability, which stands in a radical contrast with sustainability, resilience, adaptation, techno-managerial fi fixes, which are the sort of mainstream, mainstream analysis of a political ecology of water, which I would argue are inherently reactionary. They are meant to make sure that nothing really changes. So a critique of political ecology focuses on questions of equitable and durable social, hydrosocial circulations. So politicizing waters, therefore, uh, revolves around 
identifying how water can be seen as a symptom for the possibilities of egalitarian, democratic, socio-ecological transformation. 